Hello and welcome to our program, Perspectives on Innovative Treatment for B-Cell Malignancies, the Convergence of Precision Medicine with Groundbreaking Therapeutics. I'm John Pagel. I'm from the Swedish Cancer Institute in Seattle, Washington, and I'm lucky enough to be joined today by Dr. Matt Davids from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, and Dr. Krish Patel, who's also here with me at the Swedish Cancer Institute in Seattle. This is an introduction to begin on the transformation of B-cell care, understanding B-cell malignancies, as well as the targeted agents, antibodies, and cell therapies. Remember, B-cell malignancies come in a wide spectrum from very aggressive malignancies to more indolent, slow-growing disease. Today, we're gonna to focus on the more indolent diseases such as CLL and non-Hodgkin lymphoma that develop in more mature B lymphocytes. These are not uncommon malignancies. CLL and non-Hodgkin lymphomas do afflict a large number of patients who are diagnosed every year in the United States. And the prevalence of this, these diseases remains quite high with lots of people living with the disease for a prolonged number of years, perhaps even decades in some cases. When we think about approaches to CLL, it's really been dominated over the last many years with the use of novel therapeutics. We're gonna talk a lot about these, in particular BCR inhibitors, B-cell signaling inhibitors, BCL2 inhibitors, and a discussion around anti-CD20 antibodies. We won't say a lot about CAR T-cell therapies here in this program, perhaps, but of course, we are excited about the emerging data and we'll see how that translates the, the landscape for patients with CLL in the near future. We'll talk a little about the novel therapeutics in follicular lymphoma, R squared or lenalidomide and rituximab has become a very important regimen for relapsed follicular lymphoma. We'll touch a little on PI3 kinase inhibitors and I'll introduce a new agent that I think is very exciting known as tazemetostat, which is an inhibitor of EZH2. And of course, the use of anti-CD20 antibodies for relapsed follicular lymphoma patients as well as frontline use as well. And then in mantle cell lymphoma, we'll have a brief discussion about BTK inhibitors. Remember that lenalidomide certainly plays a role, as does venetoclax and combinations. And now there's been the emergence of a new approved CAR T cell approach for mantle cell lymphoma that, again, won't be the focus of this discussion, but I encourage you to learn more about that as an important advance for these patients. And then lastly, this program will not focus on large cell lymphoma but do know that there's been ne several now new approved agents and some on the immediate horizon for relapsed mantle, I'm sorry, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, including polituzumab in combination with bendamycin rituximab, selenexor, and many that have emerged recently focused on CAR T cell therapies for relapsed refractory diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Our agenda is here. We're going to understand the data around BTK inhibitors or Bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitors as a targeted approach for CLL and a focus on mantle cell lymphoma as well. We'll talk about some other targeted options in these diseases, including again, PI3 kinase inhibitors and BCL2 inhibitors such as venetoclax. And again, I want to introduce to you EZH2 inhibition in relapse refractory follicular lymphoma with a new approved agent, tazemetostat. And I'm gonna ask Dr. Davids to give us a little introduction and uh, overview of the BTK inhibitor landscape in CLL. Thank you so much, John, for that great introduction. And I'm happy to discuss the role of BTK inhibitors in CLL. It's really been a privilege to uh, have witnessed this revolution in CLL care. Uh, when I started, we had chemoimmunotherapy as the only option. and uh, Fairly soon after that, we saw the rise of the B-cell receptor pathway inhibitors in the early phase clinical trials. And I remember this phase 1b2 trial, the so-called 1102 trial from Pharmacyclics, where they explored ibrutinib as a single agent in two cohorts. And uh, even just seeing the very early data, data cuts for both frontline and relapsed refractory patients, the data really looked astounding in terms of the responses that were being observed in patients with a median of four prior lines of therapy, heavily pretreated with multiple uh, rounds of chemo immunotherapy, uh, quite a few patients with deletion 17P, a very high risk form of CLL, and nonetheless seeing excellent responses. So recently we've seen very long-term follow-up from this 1102 study published. This is eight-year follow-up now of abrutinib monotherapy in CLL. 
You can see there's two cohorts here, a treatment naive and a relapsed refractory. The bulk of the patients on this study were indeed relapsed refractory. Uh, so you can see that in this, this larger group of about 100 patients, that the estimated seven year PFS is, is 34%. Median PFS 52 months and over half of patients still alive at seven years. And just remember, this is a patient population where with chemoimmunotherapy, we might expect a few months or at best a year or two of, of uh, response. So truly an outstanding response for relapsed refractory CLL patients. A much smaller group of treatment naive patients, only about 30 patients in this study. And certainly that curve also look, looks excellent in terms of the durability. The median progression free survival has not been reached in this frontline setting. Uh, there were a small number of 17P patients here, so this was a mix of different patients, but the estimated seven-year PFS rate is 83%, uh, so it certainly looks fantastic uh, in this population. Now, you know, this is a single-arm study, uh, early phase data, but now we have the luxury that we can look in the phase three setting at a larger and, and robust data set of patients treated, again, with abrutinib monotherapy, given as a, a continuous treatment until time of progression or toxicity. And in the Alliance phase three study, they focused on the older patients. These are patients age 65 or older who tended to have some medical comorbidities. So a fairly representative population for what we see in the clinic for our CLL patients who tend to be older. And one of the very interesting aspects of this study was that it was a three arm study. So the, the central question was comparing abrutinib based regimens to a standard frontline regimen, bendamustine and rituximab, standard six month chemoimmunotherapy course. But an added benefit of this study was the third arm contained abrutinib plus rituximab. And so this really helped us to understand whether there's a benefit to adding rituximab to abrutinib in the frontline setting for CLL. So I take away two things from this PFS curve that you see here. Uh, this is the primary endpoint of the study. Number one, both abrutinib regimens were significantly better in terms of progression-free survival than bendamustine and rituximab. You can see the hazard ratios here are on the order of about 0.4, favoring the abrutinib-based regimens. And then the second really key point is that you can see that the IR curve and the I monotherapy curve are essentially overlapping. So there was no difference in progression-free survival between these two abrutinib arms. And so this really does suggest that there's no benefit to adding rituximab to abrutinib in the frontline setting for CLL. Now, I wouldn't necessarily extrapolate this to all BTK inhibitors or all CD20 antibodies, which we may touch on in a little bit. Uh, but certainly this does argue strongly for ibrutinib monotherapy as a great option for these older patients with CLL. At this point, there's no difference in overall survival in this frontline study. The trial did allow crossover of uh, BR patients over to ibrutinib, so that may erase some of that. Uh, but certainly it's a very promising approach for patients to be able to receive a chemotherapy-free approach uh, in the frontline setting. So what about younger CLL patients? This is a smaller group in general, uh, but we certainly see these patients in their 50s and, and early 60s uh, fairly commonly. And so the ECOG group looked at a, a similar question of comparing an abrutinib-based regimen as continuous therapy to a time-limited chemoimmunotherapy regimen. And this is the ECOG 1912 study. And here you can see that patients were randomized in a two-to-one fashion to continuous abrutinib with about a six-month combination of rituximab followed by abrutinib monotherapy until time of progression versus the standard six months of, of FCR chemoimmunotherapy. And with 45 months of follow-up on the left side, you see the primary endpoint clearly favored the abrutinib arm over FCR. This was a particularly pronounced benefit in the patients with unmutated IGHV, which tends to be a more steadily progressive form of CLL and typically relapse more, re relapses more quickly after chemoimmunotherapy-based regimens. In the mutated IGHV patients, these differences were, were smaller and it actually was not a statistically significant improvement with the abrutinib-based regimen at this time point. But strikingly, on the right side, you see the overall uh, survival improvement that was noted with the abrutinib-based regimen over FCR. Now, the numbers here are still fairly small, so I think this is an intriguing finding and something we need to pay attention to. Uh, I think initially we had some concerns that perhaps these were infectious deaths from FCR, and it, it turns out that's not really the case. These were mostly progression events in patients receiving FCR, uh, and it certainly does speak to the power of using an abrutinib-based regimen first. Uh, and, you know, this is a little bit confusing, of course, because we have abrutinib rituximab here, and we just saw data suggesting we might not need the rituximab. Uh, but certainly this is supportive of using abrutinib-based regimens in the younger fit patients. Uh, it's certainly a very active approach, uh, but does require a continuous therapy approach. So we talked about the older CD20 antibody rituximab. We have newer CD20 antibodies now, such as the type 2 glycosylated uh, obinutuzumab antibody. 
uh, which is more potent at killing CLL cells in preclinical data. And from earlier studies like the CLL11 trial, at least in combination with chlorambucil, obinutuzumab led to an overall survival benefit compared to chlorambucil with rituximab. And so moving forward, I think we're going to be using more obinutuzumab in our CLL patients. And this is a, a study called Illuminate that generates some interesting data around the combination of abrutinib with obinutuzumab. And comparing these patients in the frontline setting to the chlorambucil obinutuzumab regimen, uh, one to one randomization here. And you can see that abrutinib uh, certainly was superior in terms of progression free survival to the chlorambucil with obinutuzumab. You see, as I was highlighting before, that with the chemoimmunotherapy based regimen, with the dotted uh, purple line here, that there's a vast improvement in progression free survival for those mutated IGHV patients compared to the unmutated IGHV patients who steadily progress. And I think an important aspect of this and other abrutinib-based studies is that if you break the curves down by IGHV mutation status, there's actually no significant difference in those unmutated versus mutated patients. So abrutinib sort of acts as an equalizer, uh, irrespective of IGHV mutation status, it can really provide durable benefits for patients. In this study, unfortunately, we don't have an abrutinib-only arm, so we can't settle that question of whether the obinutuzumab is necessary. These patients might have done very well on abrutinib monotherapy, uh, but certainly this is uh, another good regimen to consider for patients and does have a separate label uh, with the combination of abrutinib-obinutuzumab uh, in addition to the labels that are now there for abrutinib as monotherapy and a label for abrutinib with rituximab. So that's sort of the biggest uh, experience that we've had in the phase three setting in the front line for abrutinib. What about in the relapsed refractory setting? So let's dial in a little bit more to some of the details of the long-term follow-up we have from that original phase 1b2 study we discussed earlier. So this is looking specifically at those relapsed refractory patients and basing their uh, PFS on different fish cytogenetic subgroups. And at the top, you can see that those low-risk patients with deletion 13q, normal cytogenetics, or trisomy 12 seem to be the ones who have very durable responses to abrutinib over this long eight-year time frame. However, there are still patients who do not have as durable benefit. So in the red, you see patients with deletion 11Q who had somewhat more of an intermediate uh, PFS on this study. Certainly, again, far better than we'd expect from chemoimmunotherapy. Uh, but really, the group of most concern from this study for me is, is the group with deletion 17P, uh, where the median progression-free survival in that small group of patients was only around two years. And so this is clearly still an area where we have unmet need. Remember, these are patients who had been through multiple prior lines of chemoimmunotherapy in many cases, uh, and we've seen some later data suggesting that in less heavily pretreated 17 p deleted patients that perhaps there's more of a three-year PFS with abrutinib monotherapy. But nonetheless, it's certainly shorter than we'd like and, and an area where we need more combination approaches. One of the challenges, though, with ibrutinib, particularly in patients who have to stay on this drug in the long term, is toxicities. So abrutinib is a BTK inhibitor that does have a number of off-target effects on other kinases, ITK, TEC, uh, even EGFR, and others. And we can see in this uh, data set uh, from that original phase 1b2 study with long follow-up uh, that there are relatively high rates of hypertension. Nearly 30% of patients during the course of the study experienced grade 3 or higher hypertension. Uh, we see infectious complications like pneumonia, neutropenia. And atrial fibrillation, which tends to come up uh, across abrutinib studies, anywhere from sort of about 6% to maybe 15% in some studies, really depending on the patient population. In this group here, it was 9% grade 3 or higher AFib that was experienced. And you can see a smattering of other toxicities here. But I think as, as John and Krish will, will attest when we discuss this, that there are some nonspecific toxicities that we can see with ibrutinib as well that aren't completely captured in these clinical trial data. And these can be things like joint aches or um, rashes that are kind of coming and going, swelling, things like this. Uh, and so certainly there is, is room for improvement in terms of the toxicity profile uh, with abrutinib. And that's really what has led to the uh, impetus to develop second generation BTK inhibitors, which, you know, the idea really being that we want to at least preserve the efficacy that we're seeing, the outstanding uh, data that we've seen there with ibrutinib, but perhaps to improve on the toxicity profile by using a more specific BTK inhibitor that still can very effectively target BTK itself, but hopefully have fewer off-target effects on some of those other kinases. So we probably have the most mature data from this space uh, with, in CLL with acalabrutinib, uh, which is, again, a more specific uh, second-generation BTK inhibitor. Uh, I'm not going to talk about xanabrutinib, but that's another specific second-generation BTK inhibitor that's uh, in this space and being explored in CLL, but does not yet have a label for CLL. Uh, 
So focusing on acalabrutinib, which does have a label now in CLL, this, these are some of the longer term results from the 001 study. Uh, this is an earlier phase study of acalabrutinib monotherapy, about 100 patients uh, who were treated until time of progression or toxicity. And you can see that these data were just very recently updated at the ASCO meeting by John Bird and colleagues. And now there's 53 months of follow-up, and you can see an excellent event-free survival rate with 90% of patients still having not had an event, meaning either a, a progression event, death, or a toxicity that made them come off, off the drug, uh, at four years of follow-up. Uh, so nowhere near approaching a median uh, yet with this cohort. Uh, so really impressive data from acalabrutinib given as monotherapy. But again, you know, crit criticism fairly being this is an early phase study, relatively small, and, and there's no comparator arm. Uh, but also recently we saw some of the first phase three data for acalabrutinib, and I'll start with the frontline trial. Uh, this is the Elevate TN study, uh, which looked at a couple of different acalabrutinib-based regimens in the frontline setting for CLL patients compared to a, a standard regimen of obinutuzumab chlorambucil as a time-limited therapy. And here you can see that patients were randomized to one of three arms, acalabrutinib with obinutuzumab, acalabrutinib as a monotherapy, and then the standard obinutuzumab chlorambucil. So you can see, you know, kind of similar to what we saw with the Alliance study and abrutinib, uh, that there's a clear benefit of both acalabrutinib containing regimens over the chemoimmunotherapy regimen, in this case, obinutuzumab chlorambucil, which actually performed reasonably well compared to other studies of that regimen with a median PFS of around 23 months. But clearly the PFS has not uh, been reached with either of the acalabrutinib regimens at, at two years, relatively short follow-up for a frontline study, but there's a 93% rate of PFS uh, with the uh, combination of acalabrutinib and obinutuzumab, an 87% rate with acalabrutinib as monotherapy. And, you know, I think this last bullet is an interesting one. You know, I think this is, we can maybe get to this in the discussion. You know, here our conclusion uh, has been that anti-CD20 therapy may not be beneficial. And I think that's still up for some debate. So, you know, this study was not really designed or powered to make the direct comparison statistically between the acalabrutinib obin versus acalabrutinib alone. But intriguingly, they did do a post hoc analysis to look at this, and there was a hazard ratio of 0 0.49, uh, favoring the PFS benefit of adding obinutuzumab to acalabrutinib. Clearly no overall survival benefit at this early time frame, uh, but I think it will be interesting to see over time how that pans out and whether that actually does result in a long-term PFS benefit by adding this particular CD20 antibody to this particular BTK inhibitor. What about in the relapsed refractory setting? So we actually have some robust data now in the phase three setting for acalabrutinib there as well. And this comes from the ASCEND study initially presented last year and actually recently updated by Paulo Guia and colleagues and published in, in JCO. And this was a trial of relapsed refractory CLL patients who were randomized to either acalabrutinib given as a continuous therapy or the investigator's choice of one of two regimens. And you're going to hear more from Krish later on about idelalisib. Uh, idelalisib was approved in combination with rituximab, so that was one choice on this study. Uh, or the other choice was bendamustine and rituximab as a standard six-month course. And you can see on the left side of this slide the comparison of the primary endpoint, certainly favoring the acalabrutinib where there was uh, not a median PFS reached compared to a composite median PFS between those two regimens of about 17 months. You see on the right side, these curves uh, for the control arm broken down by uh, BR versus Idella R and actually looked strikingly similar. Uh, both were reasonably active, uh, but had significantly shorter PFS than the acalabrutinib regimen. Now I mentioned going into this that really toxicity is, is one of the key questions that we're, we're going to scrutinize with acalabrutinib. Uh, this is of course not head-to-head -head data yet with ibrutinib, uh, but this is some data uh, that was presented uh, a couple years ago now looking uh, from John Burden colleagues at the incidence of AEs by year on acalabrutinib. As with ibrutinib, we tend to see more of these AEs in the purple bars during that first year. Uh, but you can see that as the colors move along here, the years on therapy uh, increase, and by even sort of year two, three, four, the rates of these AEs tend to go down. Uh, you do see a headache a little more commonly uh, with acalabrutinib than the other BTK inhibitors, and that tends to come up in the first year of therapy. Uh, you, you see hypertension come up, but at lower rates than we're accustomed to seeing with ibrutinib. Uh, not on this slide, but atrial fibrillation rates seem to be less with acalabrutinib. And again, I think we can maybe speak in the discussion that, that just a, a gestalt of people who have used it, drugs like acalabrutinib, the more specific inhibitors, perhaps fewer of those uh, more nuisance toxicities like the joint aches and, and rashes and swelling and things like this.
So I alluded to the fact that combination therapy with BTK inhibitors may be important for at least some CLL patients. So certainly some patients can do well with BTK inhibitors as monotherapy or perhaps in combination with a CD20 antibody. Uh, but what about other more novel combinations? So our group asked the question several years ago now of whether we could add ibrutinib to chemoimmunotherapy safely, and would this be an effective strategy for CLL patients? You know, of course, there's a lot of interest in the field of moving away from chemoimmunotherapy, but we do know that there are patients, particularly those very young and fit patients, who can have very durable responses to FCR, perhaps even functional cure with, with complete remissions that can last 15 years or longer. So our study aimed to see whether adding a brutinib to FCR could actually augment the progression-free survival, not just for those mutated patients, but actually for the unmutated IGHV patients who typically do not have a durable benefit from FCR. So the follow-up is still fairly short in our frontline study. Uh, we looked as a primary endpoint at a pretty stringent endpoint of CR with bone marrow undetectable MRD immediately following chemoimmunotherapy, and that rate was 33%, which is higher than the historical rate of 20% with FCR alone. Uh, but perhaps even more striking to us was the rates of bone marrow undetectable MRD that deepened over time. So if you follow these graphs here, looking at all patients, that rate of undetectable MRD in the purple bar for all patients was around 84%, uh, which to our knowledge is, is still the highest rate of undetectable MRD ever achieved for a regimen with CLL. Uh, and this was equivalent in mutated and unmutated IGHV patients, which certainly is promising in terms of the potential to have durable benefit for those unmutated IGHV patients, but we don't know right now um, what the long-term follow-up looks like. We're still following these patients, of course, and, and those data will emerge over the years. And I will mention that we're not the only ones studying this question. So Nitin Jain at MD Anderson has a very interesting study looking at abrutinib with FC and obinutuzumab. And then the French Philo group has also published some compelling data looking at a similar combination. So one of the combinations that I think we're, we're most excited about is the abrutinib venetoclax combination. So, you know, most of our CLL patients are older and frailer. They're not candidates for FCR-based treatment. And so if we can develop these novel agent-only combinations, this is something that we could really potentially extend to a much broader population of CLL patients. There's certainly strong preclinical data supporting the combination of abrutinib with venetoclax. And now we're finally starting to see that come to fruition in clinical trials that have read out both in the frontline and the relapsed refractory populations. There's a number of these studies, but in the interest of time, I will, uh, uh, I will go over the results of the Captivate study, which have recently been updated. And this is a combination of abrutinib with venetoclax, the BCL2 inhibitor, uh, where there's a lead-in period of abrutinib as monotherapy uh, for three cycles, and then the patients have venetoclax added and they continue on this combination. Uh, and the patients can discontinue therapy if they achieve undetectable MRD. And here you can see really outstanding rates of undetectable MRD, both in the peripheral blood on the left and very impressively in the bone marrow on the right, where 72% of patients achieved undetectable bone marrow MRD, again, without the need for any chemo immunotherapy and novel agent only regimen. The tolerability of this regimen has generally been good, although there are some cytopenias and infectious complications that we need to watch for. Uh, but overall, this is a very impressive multi-center study, over 150 patients, uh, and really uh, validates the efficacy and safety of the abrutinib venetoclax combination. So I think with that, I'll transition back to John, who's going to lead us through some of the key questions surrounding BTK inhibitors, uh, first in treatment-naive CLL. Yeah, thanks, Matt. That was super. And uh, wow, it's just amazing how much data we have in CLL now that's really changed the landscape. And actually, I think what we should do is just take a minute or two to kind of give a, a real world experience or practice uh, uh, approach about what's being done at Dana-Farber with your group. And, and Chris, maybe I'll bring you in and ask you to tell us a little about what's happening uh, you know, at Swedish and how we approach these patients now with treatment naive CLL. Um, you know, I mean, one of the biggest things we have to remember is that this is still a disease of people who are a bit older, median age is around 70, 72, and goes along with that, to, you know, at least 90% of patients will have comorbidities, and I'd say at least half have at least one serious major comorbidity like uh, pulmonary disease like COPD or perhaps coronary artery disease, kidney disease. So, you know, uh, Matt, I'm just going to ask you, you know, at Dana-Farber, you know, most of the patients that you see are those kinds of patients. And in the treatment-naive setting, you know, really what's your approach to that patient? Uh, is it single-agent uh, uh, BTK inhibitors? Or is it trying to, to uh, evolve to um, other uh, more aggressive therapies, even if people, uh, you know, are more fit? Uh, 
Uh, give us a little flavor of like w how you approach these patients at Dana-Farber. Yeah, so John, th these are long conversations, as you know now, because there's so many different treatment options and there's a lot of data to review. And, and you know, it obviously depends on the patient how much detail they want to dive into there. But uh, some of our patients really do want to hear all the options. And, and for those patients, I really go into some depth with, with pros and cons of all of these approaches. You know, of course, a big part of the conversation is uh, some of the other regimens we haven't talked about yet, whether it's a venetoclax, obinutizumab, for example, uh, other chemo immunotherapy. So sort of just initially focusing here on the BTK decision. You know, I, I think that, uh, you know, my, my take on the data is we're using really BTK monotherapy for most of our patients. Uh, I have not been convinced by the uh, ad addition of the CD20 antibody. I think that's particularly the case for ibrutinib. Uh, you know, we have very clear data that there's no benefit with rituximab. We don't have any randomized data supporting the addition of obinutuzumab. Although given the ambiguity there, I do sometimes present that as an option to a patient uh, so that they can understand that that's an approved regimen that looks very, very good, but we don't know if it's better than a brutinib alone. And I would say most of my patients would still choose a brutinib as a monotherapy, certainly more convenient. Uh, and we don't know that there's benefits of the CD20. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, and, and, you know, it, that's, of course, the majority of patients. I think that's kind of... Uh, what Chris would even, and I would say is our experience at Swedish, but, you know, we do see occasionally very aggressive uh, biology, at least with TP53 mutations or rarely, of course, deletion 17Ps in the front line, but they do exist. And we do understand that those patients who have uh, an unmutated immunoglobulin heavy chain gene might also do uh, worse. So, uh, Chris, I'll ask you, you know, at Swedish, is there a different approach for someone who comes in with those high-risk features, in particular, you know, we worry about these people progressing quick, quickly or even an eventual transformation, Richter transformation. So up front, when you see those things, and again, albeit we recognize they're not particularly common, but they do happen. What's your thinking about what you're going to do and how you're going to approach that patient, not only at that point, but even how your thinking might be uh, planning for the future? Yeah, so I think Matt did a great job of highlighting all the data, and, and so certainly we know that uh, BTK monotherapy uh, provides uh, better outcomes for those patients than chemoimmunotherapy, but as he showed as well, we still recognize that having those adverse prognostic features uh, still carry some meaning. So as you pointed out, some of those patients might be expected to have shorter durations of response to BTK monotherapy alone. So. You know, these are the patients where I think the combinations that Matt brought up that are being studied in clinical trials are really uh, critically important. So uh, using BTK inhibitors as part of uh, therapies that maybe incorporate um, venetoclax or, or other novel agents, I think is particularly important for these high-risk patients because uh, we can see from the, the long-term follow-up of uh, certainly ibrutinib data uh, that while these patients do better than they did with chemoimmunotherapy, they still have a need for, for additional therapies later on, and so we want to try to put our best foot forward. Um, to your second point, John, I think you know, these are the patients where we really have to be very thoughtful about what's the sequence of events going to be after progression, right? So we need to kind of think about uh, the tools we have in the toolkit. You brought up some of those earlier. For example, is that going to be cellular immunotherapies? Is that going to be uh, novel BTK inhibitors that that uh, might overcome resistance from the existing generation agents. These are all things that we want to kind of be thinking about and having a, as a discussion with our patients who have these high-risk abnormalities. Yeah. Let's switch and just have a little discussion about uh, the landscape that uh, Matt painted in relapse refractory patients. Um, you know, uh, Matt, I'm going to come back to you. Uh, you know, we've talked about FCR, um, but uh, we haven't really talked about bendamustine and rituximab. Is there any role for bendamustine and rituximab and CLL anymore? I would say very little. You know, I, I think that you could make the case based on the alliance data that, that we reviewed that for the mutated IGHV patients where there's, there's actually no progression-free survival benefit yet uh, over a continuous abrutinib uh, that you could, you could think about a time-limited BR regimen there. But uh, certainly here in the relapsed refractory setting, I, I really don't think there's a role for chemoimmunotherapy. I'm going to sh review some data in a minute with the Murano study uh, where there was an overall survival benefit with the venetoclax-based approach over BR. So I think that really argues strongly we should not be reusing chemoimmunotherapy for patients. Yeah. And, and Chris, you know, the, the obvious uh, um, use of is that these novel agents get used in the front line, but it raises the question about sequencing and I'm just wondering about at Swedish and your approach when you see one of these patients, 
what you know in general you like to think about with regard to sequencing therapy? It's probably a relatively straightforward and simple uh, answer, but I think uh, we'd all like to hear what what you think about that. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, the first thing I, I would say is that, you know, patients who have progressed on novel agents, um, we know they don't tend to do well with chemoimmunotherapy. So, you know, once if we haven't used chemoimmunotherapy up front, um, we're not usually re reaching into that, that toolbox uh, for patients later on. Um, in terms of the sequence between the two kind of classes of novel agents, BTK inhibitors or BCL2 antagonists, we have more data for the sequence of patients progressing on BTK inhibitors and then being able to to have good responses to venetoclax-based regimens, although uh, certainly, as, as you all know, and, and uh, there's a growing kind of experience of uh, the opposite sequence as well with patients who might be treated initially with venetoclax-based regimens uh, having responses to BTK inhibitors. So I would say that, you know, in sequencing of novel agents, that sort of remains to be seen. Uh, the other question, of course, we're all thinking about is if somebody gets time-limited therapy with a venetoclax-based regimen, can they be retreated with venetoclax? That's a question that we don't have an answer to yet either. So, um, you know, the thing I would say that we, we can feel pretty confident about is that patients who prog progress on novel agents shouldn't really go back to chemoimmunotherapy. Yeah, right. And, and you know, they will relapse uh, even after getting BTK inhibitor. And, you know, Matt, you alluded to the idea that there's resistance that develops do you actually look for that? Do you look for the resistance and how do you do that? Uh, in the community, what advice would you give to uh, a treating physician who has a patient who's progressing on a BTK inhibitor? We actually are doing that routinely now. We have a next generation sequencing panel that we can run in-house that can detect the more common BTK and PLC gamma-2 mutations. You know, I would, I would say right now that that's most useful for us because we have trials of some of these newer BTK inhibitors uh, that may help overcome resistance, and so it's helping us to, to identify patients for those trials. I'd say in, in community practice right now, I'm, I'm not sure that it necessarily affects decision making directly. Uh, if you have the capability to do it, I think it can be interesting to know. Uh, but I don't know that it needs to be routinely done yet. But I, I certainly think that's coming. You know, as these newer drugs come along, that's going to potentially be a new option to help overcome BTK resistance. And that'll be useful to know if the patient has the mutation. Let's just uh, take a minute to go to the uh, questions from the audience that are coming in. And I have several, but I think the more interesting questions are really, uh, of course, uh, relevant to what's going on in the world today um, that are coming in. And that's really around uh, the landscape with COVID-19 and the use of these agents for CLL. Matt, you know, let me just ask you, uh, has your practice really changed? Uh, the question is asking if your practice or, or obviously Chris has changed using BTK agents uh, during the COVID-19 uh, experience? So, you know, our, our initial surge in Boston was fairly early, like, like you guys in Seattle, so sort of April for us and into May. And, you know, at, at that time, we really were trying to minimize the numbers of patients coming in physically to our center so that we could maintain social distancing. And, and so there was a, a short period of time where I really was leaning more toward BTK inhibitors because they're so convenient to start. Uh, the patients don't need to come in for an infusional component, uh, and they don't need frequent laboratory monitoring, for example, when starting venetoclax. Uh, so for a period of time, that was the preferred option. And a few of the patients where I might have kind of debated between other regimens, I, I steered them more toward BTK inhibitor therapy. You know, I would say now that things are better controlled here in Boston, that that has kind of gone away. And, and really, we're, we're discussing all the different treatment options. And I'm, I'm not hesitating to, to use other options like venetoclax, obinutuzumab, for example. Yeah. Okay. Really important to know. Let's move on. Matt, I'm going to ask you to tell us a little about venetoclax uh, for patients with CLL, and I'll turn it back to you now. Yeah, so John, I think this is how we met uh, back in the day uh, when it was called ABT199 with the first in human study. We collaborated closely on that. And uh, really from the start, I think we knew this was a very potent drug uh, for CLL patients. Uh, even though it's an oral agent and an indolent lymphoid malignancy, we saw tumor lysis syndrome early in the development of this drug. So really paradigm changing for the disease and how active this drug is in CLL. And so it's been amazing to see the, the progression over the last nine years or so that the drug's been in the clinic to see it go from those early phase studies, making some adjustments to the dosing regimen, developing the dose ramp up and, and close monitoring for tumor lysis syndrome, confirming that that's a safe way to, to give the drug, seeing the initial approvals in relapsed refractory CLL. And then uh, last year, seeing the data from CLL14, so really the, the first uh, experience that we've seen in the phase three setting for frontline CLL patients, uh, initial treatment option of venetoclax given with obinutuzumab, uh, 
And you know, we've, we've talked so far in this program about time-limited therapy with chemoimmunotherapy. Then we've talked about novel agent-based approaches with BTK inhibitors, which is a great strategy, but requires continuous therapy. And so here with venetoclax plus obinutuzumab, the hope is that this is sort of the best of both worlds. It has the time-limited nature of chemoimmunotherapy, but the novel agent-only uh, approach like with the BTK inhibitors. And so that was the, the genesis of this venetoclax obinutuzumab regimen, which is a six-month combination of the two drugs, followed by six months of venetoclax monotherapy, and then all patients stop treatment at one year, and we see how durable those effects are. This trial randomized patients to either the Venobin regimen or Chlorambucil Obin, also given for one year to match the treatment duration. And here you can see the results of the uh, primary endpoint of the study, progression-free survival, clearly favored venetoclax obinutuzumab over chlorambucil with obinutuzumab. The follow-up is now close to 40 months. And at 36 months, the progression-free survival for venobin is 82%. In other words, these patients got one year of therapy. And then two years after stopping therapy, 82% of the patients were still in remission. Very high rates of undetectable MRD at the end of treatment, what I was alluding to before, that really has translated into durable response thus far. No difference yet in overall survival, but clearly very early for this frontline study. Now, what about the different subgroups that we've been talking about? So let's start with the mutated versus unmutated IGHV. So on the left, you see the orange curves with chlorambucil. Again, like every chemoimmunotherapy study we've ever seen, we see the patients with unmutated IGHV have an inferior progression-free survival to the mutated IGHV patients. Like we saw with um, ibrutinib and the other BTK inhibitors, there does not seem to be a difference at this point in terms of the PFS between mutated and unmutated for the ven obin patients. Uh, and then you see on the right side though that there is a decrement in progression-free survival in that um, dark blue line or purple line for venetoclax obinutuzumab if patients have TP53 deletion or mutation. Now, this is a bit of a glass half full, half empty. Uh, you can certainly see there are uh, suboptimal results for those patients with TP53 aberrant disease. But on the other hand, you can see that these patients have not yet reached a median progression-free survival at 36 months, uh, and they've been off therapy completely for two years. So these are patients presumably who could be retreated with a venetoclax-based approach, or they could be switched to a brutinib, and I really don't think we know the answer yet for what the optimal therapy is for these TP53 mutated patients in the frontline setting. We talked before a bit about the sequencing of venetoclax and ibrutinib, and this is really the best prospective data that we have, the M1432 study, which is really the first prospective trial of, of any treatment for patients who are progressing on a kinase inhibitor in CLL. So this was about 90 patients who had been treated with ibrutinib and eventually had disease progression, and they were treated with venetoclax as a monotherapy. And the graph on the left is a way to illustrate the MRD. And you can see that a little over 40% of patients in the orange there were able to achieve undetectable MRD with venetoclax. The overall response rate was 65%, and close to 10% of patients did achieve a complete remission on uh, venetoclax. And that translated on the right to a progression-free survival in the order of about uh, two years. So this is a high-risk group with a median of four prior therapies, nearly half with deletion 17P, progressed on ibrutinib, so certainly suggesting very potent activity of venetoclax in this population. I just wanted to take one slide to review the AE profile for venetoclax. Uh, in addition to the TLS, uh, myelosuppression can be seen with venetoclax, in particular neutropenia, which is an on-target side effect of the drug. We see grade three or higher neutropenia fairly commonly with this drug. Uh, but interestingly, we see relatively low rates of febrile neutropenia and infection, and that's because, uh, you know, to some degree, these patients can be managed quite effectively with growth factor support, antibiotics if needed, uh, and so although this is a common occurrence, it's usually manageable for most patients. We do see GI events such as diarrhea and nausea in, in a good number of patients on venetoclax. This tends to be low grade and relatively early in the course, and for most patients, this settles out over time. Of course, for all our CLL patients, we worry about infections, and we need to monitor them closely for that. Uh, we've seen select cases of autoimmune hemolytic anemia and joint pain, but these are quite rare with venetoclax. On the right side, you see a, a simplified algorithm of how to approach the TLS risk for venetoclax patients. We certainly need to assess TLS risk for our patients starting venetoclax, and this involves not just checking a blood count to see what the lymphocyte count is, uh, but also looking at the renal function and also imaging to look at the lymph node bulk. Uh, so sometimes patients can have bulky internal lymphadenopathy that can put them at higher risk for a TLS event. And we need to know that by doing a CT scan prior to starting treatment with venetoclax. All the patients will receive hydration and anti-hyperuricemics before beginning. And the patients who are at higher risk for TLS need more intensive monitoring. If they're at very high risk, we admit them to the hospital for close monitoring. Uh, but at a minimum, even in the outpatient setting, they need frequent lab checks and, and hydration. 
And uh, this is all clearly outlined in, in the label, so I direct you there if, if you're starting a patient on venetoclax. So I think with that, I'll turn it back to you, John, for a discussion of BCL2 inhibitors in CLL. Let's just do that for a few minutes here. Uh, again, I think uh, hearing a little bit of experience from uh, you guys would be very valuable. Uh, it certainly is for, uh, to me. But Matt, let's just start at the bottom because you just talked about TLS. And I think you know TLS is something we have to have uh, really at the forefront of our mind and be on our toes about. Is there, do you have a strategy for how you might mitigate that in someone uh, who, ha who you're going to deliver venetoclax to? And in particular, what kind of patient would that be? Yeah, so you know, I, this is a, a, a challenging question. You know, I, I think in the frontline setting, the way the obinutuzumab venetoclax regimen is set up, you have some tumor bulk reduction with the initial three weeks of obinutuzumab. So that does in and of itself help mitigate the risk. I think we need to be particularly vigilant in the relapsed refractory setting, where if we're starting venetoclax as a monotherapy, we don't have that type of cytoreduction. Uh, or even if we're using the Murano regimen, we use the venetoclax first and then add in the rituximab. So I, I'm particularly careful in that setting. Uh, you know, these patients need to have blood work drawn, you know, fairly close to the time of their initial dosing. Uh, you can do it the day before to, to save some time. Uh, bring them in very early and, and get them, you know, really one of the keys in our practice is getting them dosed early. That really facilitates having this done in the outpatient setting, where then we can get a lab draw six to eight hours later, and it's not being drawn at five or six in, in the evening, it's being drawn at one or, one or two o'clock in the afternoon. And we're, we're lucky in, in our lab, we can get those labs turned around in a few hours and get them back before everyone goes home for the day. I would say if you're in a scenario where you, you don't have access to, to rapid lab returns, it may be better to admit the patient to the hospital where those labs can be turned around and monitored more carefully. And so even for patients who have lower or medium risk of TLS by the label, it's, it's always you know, a safe bet to admit those patients if you have concerns about the, the availability of lab turnaround. Yeah, good, good thoughts. I think very important thoughts. Chris, you know, venetoclax is a, is a super drug and it's important. I, I still you know, wonder how we're going to figure out where it's the right place to use it, but it does have appeal with time-limited therapy as uh, Matt has talked about. You know, do you see that is even an option uh, for patients who might be older or less fit in the front line. I, I guess even further, my question is, who do you like to do time-limited therapy on and, and who's not a good candidate? Or are, is everybody a good candidate? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I, I think this is kind of alludes to what but both you and Matt mentioned earlier. This is often a very long conversation when we have choices, right? And so we really want the patient's voice to be part of this. I'll maybe take the first or the second question and say, you know, I, I think after um, seeing updated data from CLL14, I think probably many of us were, were took note of the fact that patients with p53 aberrations seem to maybe not to do quite as well with the time limited therapy. We don't really know the answers to why that is. Is that simply because it's a time limited therapy, and perhaps those patients would do a little bit better with extending the course of therapy? Um, it seems unlikely it's a biologic problem. We know that from, you know, relapse refractory setting that patients with P53 abnormalities who, for example, were given venetoclax monotherapy the way you two all met, um, you know, can do quite well. So I, I do think in the frontline setting, I'm, I'm maybe a little, uh, a little more reticent to, to recommend um, venetoclax-based therapy for, for those P53 aberrant patients. Um, for the other patients, I think it really just comes down to that value that you place on time-limited therapy or not and what that means to the patient's quality of life. And, and certainly in, in older patients, the comorbidity you want to be very mindful of is, is renal impairment. Uh, that can substantially change the risk of tumor lysis for patients. So. Let's move on. Uh, Chris, I'm going to ask you to tell us a little about PI3 kinase inhibitors. You know, PI3 kinase inhibitors have been around for quite a while as well, and they uh, aren't perhaps used quite as widely. Uh, as these other agents, but they're still pretty important. They're an agent that, uh, a class of agents that can really provide benefit to the right patients. So just give us a, uh, you know, a brief overview about where we are and the landscape with PI3 kinase inhibitors in CLL and as well as indol in indolent uh, lymphomas. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, John. Happy to do so. Um, so just to remind us all, um, you know, PI3 kinase is a particularly important kinase in uh, a number of uh, signaling pathways, and there are several different isoforms of, of, uh, that are important when we're thinking about uh, kinase inhibitors in this class. Um, in particular, the kinase that we want to inhibit that seems to be important, particularly in lymphoma genesis, is the delta isoform. So you'll see that we have several different agents here. Idelalisib, uh, duvalisib approved for CLL and follicular lymphoma, copanalisib, 
approved for follicular lymphoma and umbrilisib, which is an investigational agent uh, across a number of lymphomas. And the first thing I'll point out is all of them have uh, uh, high potency and in inhibiting the de delta isoform, which is what we want. Uh, what differs in these agents uh, is their um, inhibition of other isoforms, and that may uh, have some impacts uh, on toxicity. And uh, so, you know, I think we, we, we have a number of choices here, and we'll talk a little bit about the data that we have from some of the approved agents. Um, so just as John mentioned, PI3 kinase inhibitors do have a, a treatment role in uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphomas and CLL. Um, so while we may use them less, I, I think there are places there where we need to be aware of their activity. Um, Idelalisib was the first PI3 kinase inhibitor approved, and uh, that was uh, based on a study of idelalisib and rituximab compared to rituximab placebo. You see here the progression-free survival curve for that uh, study that was published in the New England Journal in 2014, and clearly we can see that in CLL patients um, with, who are in need of further therapy that the combination of idelalisib and rituximab was superior to placebo rituximab alone. In indolent non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, you see here in the wa uh, waterfall plot to the right here that we can see activity of uh, idelalisib in a number of different NHL histologies uh, from follicular lymphoma, the most common uh, indolent non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, but also in marginal zone and, and LPL and as well uh, small lymphocytic lymphoma, which uh, really is a, a, on the sp in the spectrum of CLL and, and uh, similarly uh, supports the data from the CLL trials. And then uh, we have approval from, uh, of duvalisib in CLL as well, uh, as well as in follicular lymphoma and copanlisib in follicular lymphoma, and I'll talk briefly about uh, the data that supports those indications. Um, so duvalisib was approved for treatment, uh, for use in relapse refractory CLL based on the phase three duo trial. So this is a trial of about 320 patients, and patients were randomized to uh, treatment either with duvalisib monotherapy until disease progression or intolerance or ofatumumab, which is an anti-CD20 antibody that uh, we don't use that often anymore, but was at the time the trial was ongoing uh, uh, a comparator or a reasonable treatment option for patients who might not have access to other uh, targeted agents or novel agents. And in that trial, we see the median progression-free survival uh, favored patients treated with duvalisib monotherapy. Um, importantly, uh, we know that uh, PI3 kinase inhibitors are active in patients with uh, deletion 17P, and that's uh, demonstrated here. If we look at the overall response rate in the patients in the DUO trial who had 17P deletion, uh, we see a superior response rate in the duvalisib-treated patients compared to those treated with the uh, ofatumumab. Um, Matt recently uh, published data uh, on the crossover aspect of the trial. So in the DUO trial, patients who are progressing on uh, ofatumumab were permitted to uh, go on to receive duvalisib. Um, and what we know about those patients is, you know, those patients uh, also were able to have a high level of, of responses to therapy once they crossed over. Um, we, you can see with a, a median duration of response of about 15 months and a progression-free survival approaching 16 months. So what about duvalisib in uh, indolent non-Hodgkin's lymphomas? So uh, this is the DYNAMO trial uh, looking at uh, activity of duvalisib in uh, indolent non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. So again, primarily follicular lymphoma, but inclusive of other lymphoma histologies as well as patients with SLL. And what you see here in the waterfall plot is nicely that, you know, the majority of patients seem to have uh, responses to, uh, to therapy with reductions in tumor bulk uh, with an overall response rate of 47.3% and the median duration of response was 10 months with a median progression-free survival of uh, nine and a half months. I'll point out that these were patients uh, that were considered double refractory. So these were patients who were refractory to an anti-CD20 antibody uh, as well as to chemoimmunotherapy. And so these can be challenging patients to care for as, as you both uh, know and many will recognize. So important to have an a, a, uh, evidence of activity for, for PI3 kinase inhibitors in this space. Um, what about copanlisib? So copanlisib is a uh, intravenous uh, PI3 kinase inhibitor. Idelalisib and duvalisib are given orally, um, and copanlisib was recently approved for uh, treatment of pa uh, patients with refractory or relapsed follicular lymphoma based on the results of the Kronos-1 study. Uh, so this was a trial of patients with relapsed or refractory indolent lymphoma who had had at least two lines of prior therapy, so somewhat similar to our uh, other trials we've discussed, and the copanlisib was given intravenously on day one, eight, and 15. Uh, 
Uh, the response rates here, again, you can see are about 60%. And so you see, again, from the waterfall plot here that we see uh, really a reduction in tumor bulk in uh, the majority of patients across different uh, lymphoma histologies. And in a recent updated analysis, we see a duration of response that's greater than a year with a median progression-free survival of 11.3 months. So I think, again, in patients who have had uh, two lines of prior therapy for their indolent non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, we see activity across all of these agents, um, and they're important. Uh, I'll mention just um, briefly here, and we'll touch on it again after our discussion, but we know that PI3 kinase inhibitors have unique toxicities. These are often immune-mediated toxicities. These are toxicities that uh, can sometimes be limiting in, in the time that patients are on therapy. And so I think for those reasons, uh, we've less commonly used these agents. But again, these data really support a high level of activity in patients that have been uh, often heavily pretreated. And we don't want to forget about the class when it, when it comes to thinking about treatment options for our patients. And so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to John for some uh, discussion. Yeah. I think you know, we just want to remember that there are safety uh, concerns around these agents. And if you understand those, um, I think it helps you to use the agents and feel comfortable and to manage the patients if, in fact, they either have uh, one of these uh, safety uh, concerns or even to mitigate the risk and manage them before they get uh, those types of things. So remember with idelalisib and duvalisib in particular, that uh, we watch for immune-mediated events of transaminitis, typically happens a little bit early. It's reversible with holding the agent. Even sometimes we can restart the idelalisib or the duvalisib. Pneumonitis, it can happen at any time. So if you have a cough, kind of an insidious onset of some dyspnea, look for that. We want to make sure we don't miss it. it needs to sometimes and often be treated with steroids. And then lastly, of course, an immune-mediated diarrhea or colitis. Happens late, remember, it happens many months later, most often up to maybe six, nine months later. Um, and it can be quite significant. So being on top of it, making sure that we anticipate it or understand it, and sometimes even intervening early if we need to with steroids uh, is certainly reasonable as well. Let's switch uh, now gears to understanding some of the newer therapies. And in particular, I just want to focus on one that I'm particularly excited about, and that's actually an EZH2 inhibitor known as tazemetostat. This agent was just recently approved. It's approved for patients who have relapsed follicular lymphoma where they have a mutation in EZH2 uh, and they've failed prior therapies, or actually it's even for people that don't have other options and they've relapsed at any point with their follicular lymphoma. So it has a broad indication. And I think that's one of the nice things about going to an agent like this is that there might be specific times where we'll think about using this agent earlier or perhaps other times a little bit later. And you have the option now with a new agent on the block. And what is it? Well, tazemetostat is what we call an epigenetic modifier or regulator of the EZH2 gene. So EZH2 is, um, very important for B cell differentiation. It's uh, critically important uh, as a driver, so to speak, in that process in germinal center formation. And that's normal B cell biology. And so you can imagine that if cells are actually uh, so-called rested in their development, that that differentiation can be, um, uh, or that arrest can be overcome by targeting EZH2. Um, and even more in particular for those mutations that develop in EZH2, which are typically gain-of-function mutations. So the biology is relevant uh, for targeting EZH2 both in mutant as well as in wild-type patients. And I should point out that the mutations are not particularly common. They only happen in about 20% of patients. But you can use the agent. It's approved in both wild-type as well as mutant patients. And what's the data that supports its use? Well, it comes from this phase two study that led to the accelerated approval of tazemetostat. There were two cohorts of patients. They were wild type or mutant ECH2 patients. Tazemetostat is an oral agent. It's delivered twice a day at 800 milligrams daily. And you treat patients uh, essentially indefinitely until they either have progression or until they have some intolerance. And that's actually, I think, one of the beauties of this agent that uh, makes it appealing 
in an older patient population, perhaps who have failed other therapies, and that is the tolerability. You can see here that there are not a lot of grade three, four adverse events, and in my experience, the rates of grade one, grade two are actually quite low, and they're actually usually very, very well tolerated. This drug seems to be extremely well tolerated as a single agent, and I think that actually makes us more excited even uh, down the road about using it in combinations. There are low rates of discontinuation, maybe about 5% as a monotherapy, and uh, the vast majority of patients do not need a, a dose reduction because of a treatment of urgent adverse event. So very, very well tolerated therapy. If you look at the response rates in the two different cohorts of patients, mutant and wild type, they are different. There are outstanding responses in people who have the mutation in EZH2, close to 80% with some complete remissions. Um, but also you'll note that there are meaningful responses. About a third of patients will have a response if they have wild type EZH2. And we know that that can provide significant remissions or durations of remissions for, for people who are getting this therapy, perhaps if they've failed multiple lines. When you look at these patients, the mutated patients had a median number of two prior therapies. The wild type actually had have three prior therapies at a median. And in fact, many of these people had failed autologous stem cell transplants. Many of them, in fact, the majority of them were refractory to rituximab and many with very, very high risk features, including being refractory, not only to rituximab, but to an alkylating agent as well. And so you can get remissions that can be quite durable. So even eight, 10, 12 months, 13 months. So a year or so of these very high risk, difficult patients. And on the next slide, you can see a little more about the progression-free survival and overall survival of the two different cohorts. And they're relatively similar. So progression-free survival, well, somewhat, Limited uh, in the wild type patient population, again, can be meaningful in the right patients and understanding that the mutant patients even further will provide some benefit. And hopefully that continues to improve the natural history of these patients with relapsed follicular lymphoma. I'll actually then go to some questions. And I'll note that along with the approval of tazemetostat is that there's an associated companion diagnostic for EZH2 mutation testing that can be done, but it is not required. As I said, it's approved in patients with relapse disease who have wild type EZH2 as well. So you can test if you want to, or you don't have to. It depends on your, uh, your thinking about how you want to approach a specific patient. So Chris, I'm gonna ask you, I know that you're exploring uh, the use of tazemetostat in some studies and um, wondering where you see the EZH2 inhibitors, and in particular, you know, with other options, like. PI3 kinase inhibitors for people that have relapsed with their follicular lymphoma. Yeah, so I think this is, as you mentioned, John, a very exciting class, um, you know, to have activity as a single agent, but also a very low toxicity profile uh, means that, you know, we're likely going to be able to combine this treatment with others. And so I look forward to those trials that, that will be going on to look at that. Um, you know, I, I think this is very meaningful for patients that have uh, you know, limited options because the toxicity profile is very favorable. And we were talking about a class of medicines that's active, PI3 kinase inhibitors that maybe do have some toxicities people have to be cautious about. So I, I think, you know, this is a tool that, that will definitely have a, a, an impact on our patients. And, and uh, mainly what excites me is that toxicity profile is, is this is a very tolerable medicine. Yeah, I, I agree with you. The drug is very well tolerated. And, and you know, um, people can benefit from the, the agent uh, uh, over time, even with stable disease, it seems, or people that are not having real dramatic responses. But we have to remember we're palliating these patients most often in relapsed follicular lymphoma. We're not curing them. So it's nice to have another tool that's well, well tolerated in our toolbox for, for these people. And I'll just ask you, I mean, what's your approach? Are you thinking about how you might approach uh, do the mutation testing. Remember, it's going to take a couple of weeks to get the results back. So what, what do you think? How, how would you do that? Yeah, so I, I think you brought up a good point, which is that you can use the medicine regardless of the mutation status. And so, um, you know, we, we haven't been doing it routinely for all patients. Um, certainly, it's something that we would include in other mutational testing. I think it's quite helpful, especially if you're thinking about 
um, you know, options that patients have in clinical trials or not. And, and as you mentioned, there seems to be some suggestion that perhaps, um, you know, there is a, a little bit more benefit in the patients who have mutations. So we haven't used it uh, in, in uh, broadly speaking, but I, I think, uh, you know, having that mutational testing, maybe doing that early on in the patient's uh, disease course is, is helpful because then you have that information later on when you're making uh, treatment decisions. So maybe even tests at the time of diagnosis? Yeah, perhaps. So then that way you've got the information at the time the patient needs to, to have a treatment decision. But would you, um, would you limit your thinking about using the agent if they were still wild type? Um, I, I think they're kind of, uh, as the label suggests, you know, you're really trying to think about what alternative options are available as well. So you can certainly use it in patients who have wild type. And, um, you know, and so I think we'll, we'll probably need more data and more follow-up as well, right, to see kind of what happens to wild type patients when we're using this agent in combinations or, um, you know, in, in different ways. Yeah, good thinking. Well, let's uh, let's move on, and you know, I'm going to um, kind of continue with with your with you, and I'd ask you to give us a little uh, update about BTK inhibitors and mantle cell lymphoma. You know, Matt and I get all the attention because CLL seems to be uh, where all the love is delivered in B cell malignancies. But you're a mantle cell focused physician, so here, take it away. Give us a little about BTK inhibitors and mantle cell. Sure. So thanks, John. Um, you know, I'll, I'll take a, a really high-level approach. I, d I don't think we want to go into great detail of all the data we have, but really just to frame kind of how we're using BTK inhibitors in mantle cell lymphoma. Uh, so just to remember, you know, mantle cell lymphoma is generally considered an aggressive lymphoma. Um, many of our patients um, are diagnosed in their uh, late 60s. We have to kind of factor that into our frontline uh, therapy decision making. And here I think uh, we kind of outline sort of the approach that we might use in most patients who are diagnosed with mantle cell lymphoma. So if patients are fit and they're otherwise well, we might consider aggressive regimens that incorporate a consolidative uh, autologous stem cell transplant. And the types of regimens we're still using for the very uh, first therapy are largely chemotherapy based. We know that mantle cell lymphoma is largely an incurable disease. So even patients who get very intensive therapies are likely to have a need for second-line therapy, and that's really what I'm going to focus on uh, here. And so here, I think um, BTK inhibitors have really been revolutionary, much like they have been in CLL. They've really become a preferred option for second-line therapy, and we're really spoiled for choices. So you can see in the NCCN guidelines here that um, our preferred regimens, uh, we have three BTK inhibitors. So ibrutinib, really the first uh, to, to prove it's uh, worth. Um, we have a lot of data for ibrutinib, including recently a pooled analysis of seven different clinical trials, which shows us that uh, median progression-free survival for patients who are receiving ibrutinib as a second-line therapy can be as long as, say, two years or so. Um, and then more recently, approvals for acalabrutinib and xanabrutinib based on uh, single-arm phase two clinical trials with uh, progression-free survival that looks quite comparable, so about you know, 22 to 24 months or so. So a lot of our patients can go on single agent uh, BTK inhibitor in the second line or uh, later and expect to have um, initially very good disease control. That said, we know that um, uh, patients often will relapse and so we, we continue to develop new therapies, BTK-based or otherwise in, in mantle cell lymphoma and very recently have the approval of uh, CAR T-cell-based therapy um, for mantle cell lymphoma. So really a lot uh, to be, uh, I think, very uh, thankful for. Um, perhaps emerging data, um, you know, I'll, I'll touch briefly on the combination of venetoclax and ibrutinib. So much like in CLL, we know that this combination is active in mantle cell lymphoma. We have um, some data from a very small trial called AIM that shows uh, certainly important clinical activity. And then we have ongoing uh, clinical trials, uh, phase three clinical trials of a combination of ibrutinib and venetoclax compared to ibrutinib alone from the Sympatico trial. So a lot to come for BTK inhibitors and mantle cell lymphoma, but really have become, I would say, a preferred option for, for relapse refractory mantle cells. So I'll just kind of highlight again that, that we have a three-year update for the, the AIM study, and you see that here, uh, really a high level of uh, progression-free survival at three years. It's a small study. Um, and then we do have data for, for use of the combination of ibrutinib and rituximab in elderly mantle cell lymphoma patients. So I mentioned here that fitness factors into our initial choices of therapy. And you can see here from a small study that uh, we can have you know, quite, quite good outcomes or encouraging outcomes, uh, uh, small study aside. Um, and then I'm just going to um, 
turn over to John here uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about this and then um, hopefully we have a little bit of time to talk about the Aspen data in a moment. Well, let's just take a, a couple of minutes and, and not, not much, but I'm going to come back to, to Matt because it's certainly relevant in CLL as well. Is there a way to differentiate how we use these agents? Um, they're all super good agents. I mean, we have long, lots of good follow-up with ibrutinib. That's really important to know about that long-term safety data. Um, we have some of these other uh, emerging agents like uh, calibrutinib and zanubrutin. Now all three are approved in mantle cell. But even in CLO, you have to make decisions. Do, do, you, uh, do you have an approach or is it just kind of a flip a coin, so to speak? Yeah, it's tough. I, you know, I think that as as you say, we we uh, have a lot of data for these drugs individually from their own trials. We don't have too much head-to-head -head data yet, although I think Chris is going to share a little bit from Waldenstrom's in a minute between ibrutinib and zanabrutinib. And I think in, in CLL, we've been really eagerly awaiting the results of the Elevate RR study, where patients were randomized in the relapse setting to ibrutinib or acalabrutinib, and that will really be the first time we have ro robust head-to-head -head data in in CLL. But my, you know, my sense from having used all three of these agents is that the efficacy profile seems pretty similar to me. Uh, it's really safety that may end up differentiating them. Uh, and in particular, both acalabrutinib and zanabrutinib uh, do seem to be quite well tolerated in, in my experience. They're kind of more similar to each other, whereas abrutinib, I, I feel like, has a bit of a different safety profile from those two drugs. Uh, and you know, I think that's going to bear out as you'll see the data in, in Waldenstrom's and probably what we'll also eventually see in CLL. Okay, well, let's just kind of go on, and I, I think, Chris, just tell us quickly, if you don't mind, about the Aspen trial. You introduced that, so I'll ask you to give us just a few brief thoughts on that. This is, of course, not for mantle cell or even CLL. It was done in Waldenstrom's, but why, why is this trial important? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I think the context is really important. As you say, uh, John, and as Matt alluded to, we use BTK inhibitors across all kinds of different B-cell malignancies, and so we're all kind of awaiting head-to-head -head comparisons for um, the agents that we, we have available to us today. So the Aspen trial is a phase three uh, randomized trial of Xanabrutinib, the second generation BTK inhibitor compared to Ibrutinib in uh, Waldenstrom's where we have a, approval for Ibrutinib already. And it's really the first uh, mature uh, uh, phase three randomized study to compare two uh, BTK inhibitors that we already have available in the clinic to one another. And what's important from this trial, I'm not going to really talk about the efficacy data. Uh, basically, the trial was designed to look at, um, you know, superiority of zanabrutinib with resp respect to response, and it didn't meet that endpoint. But I'm really going to focus on what we learned from the uh, adverse events uh, that were uh, seen in the trial. So as Matt um, has shared, uh, zanabrutinib uh, is a more selective BTK inhibitor, and so I think the hypothesis or the expectation was that perhaps with more selectivity, perhaps we'll see a difference in the adverse event profile. And uh, that these data were presented at ASCO, and we see that clearly here. If we look really at the um, adverse events that we know well to be associated with BTK inhibitors, um, in particular, things like uh, atrial fibrillation, um, as well as uh, hypertension. Uh, what you see here is that in all grades, there was less atrial fibrillation in patients treated with zanabrutinib compared to ibrutinib, less high-grade um, uh, atrial fibrillation as well, and similar, we see a similar pattern for hypertension. Importantly, we know that ibrutinib uh, does have some off-target effects, and some of those off-target effects might account for some of the toxicities that we've alluded to earlier. Uh, diarrhea may be one of those, and in particular, you see a difference in the two uh, BTK inhibitors in terms of rates of diarrhea. And then even importantly, hemorrhage. We know BTK itself is important in platelet function, but there are other off-target kinases that may also be important in the bleeding risk. We uh, C and BTK inhibitors, but we can see some difference here. So, you know, really this is the first trial to present a head-to-head -head comparison in a randomized uh, setting of two BTK inhibitors. And what we can learn from this trial is that selectivity of the BTK inhibitor really does seem to impact that safety profile and adverse event profile, as Matt alluded to. And, and certainly while this data is from Waldenstrom's, what we know from you know, experience certainly of, of BTK inhibitors across different uh, trials is that we see a similar adverse event profile across different disease histologies. So we're uh, probably expecting to see a, a similar difference in, in the head-to-head -head comparators of BTK agents in different histologies, um, and in particular in CLL, as Matt alluded to. Great. Uh, important, interesting, emerging data. You know, it, we, we don't have a lot of time, but I do want to take a question or two just from the audience, if I could. Yeah. 
I'll ask you, Chris, you know, you, you, um, you discussed, uh, you know, emerging as CAR T cell therapy and mantle cell lymphoma. Um, where do you put BTK inhibitors in that sequencing and process? Are you going to give a BTK inhibitor before a CAR T, after a CAR T, or, or, or how do you think about who the patients are and where you're going to sequence those agents? Yeah, I think two factors that are important in an trying to answer that question. Uh, the first is that in the trial that led to the approval for the CAR T cell, uh, patients enrolled in that trial were required to have been treated with a BTK inhibitor. So uh, that trial really tells us about the e efficacy of CAR T cells in patients who have already had a BTK inhibitor and then need further therapy for their mantle cell lymphoma. And the second is really just reflecting on the toxicities we see with CAR T cells. So certainly we're all excited about CAR T cell therapy and mantle cell lymphoma, but there can be some high grade toxicities. So patient selection is particularly important. Uh, we know that these are older patients. So I think my practice will likely remain that for many patients, BTK inhibitors would be my preferred option first. And then we're really thinking about the CAR T cell option for the patients uh, who, who need uh, further therapy beyond that. Yeah, maybe I'll just, there's, you know, th these are almost same kinds of questions that come in, Matt, just that same kind of thing in CLL. W you know, is there a, a role of BTK inhibitors around CAR T cell therapies there? And in particular, is there a role for a specific agent uh, in, in CLL? What do you think the landscape's going to look like? So, you know, I think that in general in CLL, the response rates and particularly the complete response rates with CAR T therapies have been a bit lower than what we've seen in other B-cell malignancies like DLBCL. And some of that re really may have to do with the inherent T-cell dysfunction that we see in CLL patients. If you're relying on a, a dysfunctional T-cell to, to be the killing agent, then that, that can be problematic in some patients. So we've seen some intriguing data now combining ibrutinib with CAR T-cell therapy in CLL. It's still early days there, but there are some theoretical benefits of the ibrutinib there, not so much for CLL disease control, although that might be occurring, but actually to, to harness the power of the T-cells to help shift that Th1, Th2 balance to make these CLL T-cells less dysfunctional and more potent at, at killing CLL cells. And so I, I think that that actually might be a unique aspect with ibrutinib compared to the other BTK inhibitors, because we think this may be mediated through one of those off-target effects on ITK, which the other BTK inhibitors wouldn't have. So I think that's an interesting developing story there. Yeah, I, I'm pretty excited about that. I think biology is uh, evolving, understanding that, and we're excited to see where CAR T cells land in CLL. There's lots of questions come in. Fortunately, I guess the good news is we really actually have answered most of them. And so in the sake of time, I'm going to thank both uh, Dr. Davids and Dr. Patel. Truly a outstanding presentation by both of you. I hope everybody's enjoyed it. I'm going to wrap up the program. Thanks for joining us today. I appreciate everybody uh, tuning in, and I hope you have a good day. This activity has been jointly provided by Penn State College of Medicine and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.